Good evening. Good evening. My name is Cheryl Pauls, and as president of, Univer of Canadian Mennonite University, it is my delight and honor to welcome everyone to this evening of listening and learning together with someone who arguably is the most significant voice in Canada at this time, the Honorable Senator Marie Sinclair. As we gather in this evening, we acknowledge that we learn this evening as we learn and live in all times here at CMU on Treaty One lands, lands that are the original homelands of the uh, Ashinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Denny pe peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. And as we remember this, we honor in particular where we are, Treaty One, signed in 1871 between Indigenous and settler peoples before Creator. We also honor Treaty Th Three from where we receive and uh, share in our clean, clear drinking water. And as we remember these treaties and look for new ways of living into them, we lament the ways that we have not received well the generous welcome and the terms of the treaties uh, that we received when we signed them. And as we lament and we consider things we have done that we not ha to have done and things that we just simply have neglected, we commit to living and learning in new ways and to honor the peoples who are here before us and with whom uh, a generous welcome of land and of all things of learning are shared. In this time and, and, and in this evening now, I would uh, like to welcome Dr. Wendy Craker. Wendy will be introducing uh, Senator Sinclair. Wendy is the co-director of the Canadian School of Peacebuilding, which is an uh, institute each June here at CMU. And it, this year, it's in its 10th year. And so we celebrate that year and that, that anniversary with, with, this, with this gathering today. Uh, with CSOP, or CSOP as we call it, uh, one of the commitments since the beginning is to have a focus on learning from Indigenous peoples, and that's a commitment we have kept every year. So Wendy, please come and introduce our guest this evening. Thank you. It is good to be with you folks this evening. We wondered this morning, what would happen when we woke up to this white world? And I thought to myself, as I walked out on the river this afternoon, contemplating this evening, that to come out on an evening like this was in fact a sign of our courage to interact in even more challenging issues than simply a snowy day in Winnipeg, that we are much stronger than that, and we need to fortify ourselves for more complex issues that stand between us as Indigenous, settler, and Canadian people. I want to acknowledge that even though we are full here, we are more than this group here, and I want to do a shout out to several groups for you to get a sense and for you to also know there are listeners beyond what's in this room. Steve Schrader is a friend of mine who teaches at the University of Fraser Valley, and he has got a group together. Our universities are in a partnership with Peace and Conflict Studies Canada, and we are doing this exchange tonight. The Wildwood Mennonite Church in Saskatoon is gathering. The 541 Eatery and Exchange in Hamilton is gathering. And apparently Bill Thiessen has gathered some friends somewhere in Crystal City. I haven't been told exactly where. It's not that big, Marie says. And then there was a group of students from grade seven and eight from the Lavalie School. Do you want to stand and wave? And they are Senator Sinclair's. They are Senator Sinclair's fan club, I understand, and we'll be hearing a little bit from uh, one of them during our Q&A time. So we have gathered for the title of the TRC, 
calls to action, and the mountain before us, stories of hope and challenge. That was the title that we gave the Honorable Senator Murray Sinclair, and we are honored to have you here with us today. He braved the snow. He is a Manitoban. We have no doubt about that. He was raised on the former St. Peter's Indian Reserve in the Selkirk area north of Winnipeg in Manitoba. And on January 12th, and he tells me he usually likes to talk about his son in his speeches if his son is here, but Nigan is also in Saskatoon, so Nigan, if you're listening, hello to you too. Uh, January 12th, Nigan Sinclair was here to share with our community the story of the forcible relocation of the St. Peter's Reserve, which is now the Paguas First Nation. Senator Sinclair has held many roles in public life. He has been a Canadian politician, is a former judge, a First Nations lawyer, and of course was the chair of Canada's Indian Residential Schools Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He is the first Aboriginal judge appointed in Manitoba and served the justice system here in Manitoba for over 25 years. He served as the co-chair of the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry in Manitoba and as chief commissioner of the TRC. And as head of that, he participated in hundreds of hearings across Canada, culminating in the issuance of the TRC's report in June 2015. He also oversaw a multi-million dollar fundraising support program to support those TRC events and activities and to allow survivors to travel to attend the TRC events. Senator Sinclair has been invited to speak throughout Canada, the United States and internationally, including the Cambridge lecturers for members of the judiciary of various Commonwealth courts in England. He served as an adjunct professor at his alma mater at the University of Manitoba, and he's been very active in his profession and his community and has won numerous awards, including the National Aboriginal Achievement Award, the Manitoba Bar Association's Equality Award in 2001, and his Distinguished Service Award, and has received honorary doctorates from eight Canadian universities. Senator Sinclair was appointed to the Senate on April 2nd, 2016. Senator Sinclair, I ask you to come forward. I offer this tobacco to you in anticipation of your words of hope and challenge to us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome the Honorable Senator Murray Sinclair. I, um, I'm used to all sorts of introductions, some of them lengthy, much lengthier than that, and some of them very brief. Um, but the briefest introduction I ever got, thank you, the briefest introduction I ever got was seven words. And seven is a sacred number among the Anishinaabe people, so seven word introduction I thought was fabulous. I was at a survivor's gathering in Saskatchewan, and uh, survivors were all milling around and talking, and many of them hadn't seen each other for years, as always happens in those occasions. They come together only rarely, but they're excited to see each other, and so they were talking and talking, and the elder who was chairing the event and was asked to introduce me stood up and he said, everybody, okay, quiet down, quiet down, we're gonna start now, and they wouldn't quiet down. Quiet down, quiet down, please, please, quiet down. They wouldn't quiet down. So finally, he introduced me by saying, shut up, <laughs> sit down, here he is. <laughs> Seven words. <laughs> Seven words, they did. They immediately went quiet, they sat down, and I started to talk. 
So introductions are important, but they're important because they give us a chance to start. And so I want to um, begin by first of all thanking all of you for being here. Um, when uh, we were communicating by text this morning, Wendy and I, and I, I said, uh, so what's plan B in the event that the roads are impassable and people are stuck and can't get there? And <laughs> she said, don't worry, we'll get everybody there. And so when I got here, I thought, well, no, there are some people who are stuck. I think you guys were stuck here <laughs> in the snow, and you just came here because of the coffee, right? <laughs> But regardless, we're going to have a, an evening of sharing, of talking, and hopefully of learning from each other about that mountain that we're going to climb because we're going to have an opportunity to have a conversation later on. Uh, I'd like to hear some of the things that you have to say. I'd like to hear some of your questions, some of the things that you need to have clarified. <clears throat> But in order to do that, I think I better get started here and, and share some thoughts with you. Uh, one of the um, well-renowned criminal lawyers in the city of Winnipeg is Greg Brodsky. Some of you know him, may have heard of him. Greg is uh, well known for the fact that he only takes on murder cases and he only represents people who are charged with murder. And one day he was in the Court of Appeal arguing a case and uh, he started off by saying, my lords, I'd like to begin my presentation to you by telling you the definition of murder. And at that point, one of the judges of the Court of Appeal said, Mr. Brodsky, you can be assured that we know the definition of murder. At that point, Greg said, that was the mistake I made in the lower court. And often in these presentations, the mistake I make is that I assume everybody knows what we're talking about. And I don't think necessarily that everybody knows what we're talking about. Because first of all, looking around the room here, I can see some of you old fogies have been around for a while and you were there when we started the TRC over 10 years ago now. And so you followed the whole thing. But some of you are pretty young people. Some of you were just around grade school age. The La Lavalley School kids were probably four or five years old when this started. And they may have learned a few things, but I think there's some things that we can still share with them. And others of you who are university students, university type students were in junior high, high school maybe. So let me begin by asking you to join me on a thought. And the thought is, I want you to think about a little person who's important to you right now. You have a little boy or a little girl in your life, you mother, you father, you have that little boy, you have that little girl in mind, think about them. Maybe you're a grandparent, maybe you have a little grandchild who in, in mind, comes to visit you every once in a while, asks you funny questions, asks you if you ever fought dinosaurs, asks you what it was like when the, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. How old are you, Granny? How old are you, Grandpa? Oh, that's really old. Maybe you got a little nephew, a little niece likes to wrestle with you, likes to color with you, likes to listen to your stories, asks you about putting on lipstick, asks you about, what are you doing that for? How come you're combing your hair like that? Boy, I wish I could have long hair like you. Somebody important in your life who's little, think about them, four or five years of age, Think how much you love them, eh? I have a number of those little children in my life, nephews, nieces. Got a grandson who's two years old, a granddaughter who's 11, gonna be 12. She said to me the other day, Mushum, his grandfather in our language, Mushum, 
I'm going to be a teenager soon, and then I'm going to hate everybody. <laughs> but I'm never going to hate you. <laughs> That's what they do, right? They know how to touch your heart. They know how to squirm their way into the place where you hide a love that you want to share with them and want to share with everybody. Wonderful human beings, those little ones. And then imagine that a government agent comes one day and takes that child away from you without any reason. Just comes and takes that little boy, takes that little girl away from you and says, for their own good, we have to give them an education. Can't trust you to do that. You don't know how to speak the language. You're heathen, you're a pagan, you're not Christian. You're not Christian enough. You're not civilized. So we have to take your children and put them in that school. Imagine living here in Manitoba and being told your children are gonna to go to school in Saskatchewan or Alberta or in the Northwest Territories. Inuit children were taken from their families in the Baffin Island area and sent to school in Edmonton. They never got to go home when they were in the residential schools because the government the churches who were keeping them decided it was too costly to send them back just for Christmas break or for summer break. So they kept them there from the time that they were four or five years of age until they were young adults, 15, 16 years of age. In many of the schools, the children were not allowed to leave until the school had arranged for them to be married to another student because they didn't want a Christianized child who had been through the school to go home and marry a pagan. They wanted a Christian child to marry another Christian child. And so marriages were arranged, and that's how they were able to go home. But many of them were gone for a long time. My grandmother went to residential school up in Fort Alexander, Manitoba. She was taken there by her father when she was about four or five years of age. She couldn't remember how old she was. But about four or five years of age. And she was not allowed to leave because the nuns decided that she was a good candidate to be a nun. And so they kept her. They kept her there. And she used to tell us that her mother would come every summer to see her, but they wouldn't let her in to see her. Wouldn't let her in the gates of the school. So her mother would camp out in a little tent outside the gates of the school for the whole summer. And my grandmother could see her but was not allowed to talk to her, was not allowed to visit with her, was not allowed to hold her hand, was not allowed to do anything that a mother and child would normally be allowed to do. So she grew up in a different kind of environment. My grandmother didn't want to be a nun she decided that she was going to try to get out of there and the only way that she could figure out to get out of that school was to marry a Christian boy. But she couldn't find one that she liked. My grandfather was a Christian boy who went to an Anglican residential school. Now he got married, married a, an Anglican girl from the school that he went to. They got married and had three children she died, his first wife died, giving birth to their third child, and the baby died too. But as a young man, he was left with two little babies to raise, and he couldn't do it because he had to work, he had to provide. He didn't know how to take care of children. He was in a residential school most of his life, didn't know how to take care of babies. So he went to the Anglican minister in his community and he said, can you help me find a wife? The Anglican minister said, sure, I'll just ask people in the congregation, see if somebody's got a daughter that'll marry you. So they asked around, but 
No daughter wanted to marry a man who already had two babies. So the Anglican minister said, let me go and ask my friend, the priest, the Catholic Church just down the road, see if he knows anybody. So he went down to see him, to ask him if he would find somebody in the church. Asked around, nobody wanted to marry a man who already had two babies, particularly because he was an Anglican. But the a Catholic priest said, you know, up at Fort Alexander, they have this convent there, and they have young girls in the convent, and they got young girls in the school that might be looking for husbands. They might be willing to marry somebody like you. So let me give you a letter of introduction, and you can go up there and see if you can get a wife. So my grandfather, in his horse and wagon, armed with his letter of introduction, went from Selkirk, Manitoba, all the way up to Fort Alexander, Manitoba, Pine Falls, to the residential school at Saging. And when he got there, he found that there were other men there too. Because once a month, they would have a day in which young men from other communities who were looking for wives would come to the school and ask for a wife. As long as they were Christian, Catholic, and approved by the Mother Superior, they could marry somebody from the community, from the school. And so my grandfather drove his horse and buggy, his horse and wagon into the yard of the school, and he waited. Now here's where the stories kind of differ between them. My grandmother said that she was watching because she knew these men were there for that reason. And when she saw my grandfather, she said to all the girls who were lined up, don't any of you say yes to that man because I'm going to marry him. That's what she says. I, my grandfather says that he was taken into a room. He had to give this letter of introduction. He had to be interviewed by the sister. And when he was interviewed, he had to answer certain questions and he had to make certain promises. One of them was he had to convert to become a Catholic. He said, I can't do that because I come from a family of Anglicans. And they said, okay, well, as long as you promise to continue to go to church in your way, but your children that you now have, we want you to convert them. And he said, I can't do that either because their relatives are all Anglicans, and I don't want to get into an argument or a fight with them. So they said, okay. But any children you have with the woman you marry from here, they all have to be raised as Catholics. And you have to promise not to interfere with their upbringing, with their religious training, and with wherever they go to school. And my grandfather agreed to that. And he agreed that he would not interfere with any of that. And so he says all those young women were brought in, and he says he picked my grandfather, my grandmother, as the one that he wanted to marry. Now she says she picked him, but whatever. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> my grandmother never talked about what it was like in that school, but others who went to that school at that time have. It was not a nice place. My father went to that same school. He was abused sexually by a man who was there. My uncles who went to that school were also abused. My grandmother was a strong Catholic woman. She remained that way all of her life. But that was the one thing that almost drove her away from the church because when my father was abused by somebody at the school. She took all of the children out of the school and left the community. That was the only way that they could get away from the practice that had evolved of people being rounded up every year and taken to the school, was to leave. You've heard about the Underground Railroad, right, from the United States, former slaves, being moved secretively from the United States into Canada during the time after slavery had been abolished, but still when there was lots of people 
who were being chased. We had the opposite underground railway of indigenous people in Canada leaving Canada to go to the United States in order to get away from the Indian agents who came to round up the children every fall. Entire communities lost their children every September to those schools. And lots of those children who went to those schools were abused. We don't know the number of children who were abused, quite frankly. I don't think anyone will ever know. But when the settlement agreement was signed in 2005, they estimated that there were about 90,000 living survivors at that time. 80,000 of them filed claims for having been taken away to those schools. 37,000 of them claimed to have been abused sexually or physically, almost 50%. Almost 50% of those little boys and girls claimed that they were sexually or physically abused, enough to be compensated financially for their injuries for what was done to them. That's a huge number of people. If 50% of the students in this place were abused by the people here, you'd shut this place down. You would do something seriously to ensure that the people who did that were held accountable. But it didn't happen. One of the presenters who came to us at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said, Indian residential schools were like a candy store to those who went there, to a pedophile. It was like easy pickings. Lots of people who were accused of having abused children in those schools abused multiple numbers of children. So I don't want you to think that there were 80,000 abusers or 37,000 abusers. That's not the case at all. I suspect, in fact, that probably there were a few thousand abusers over the years that the schools were in place, 150 years. Because each of the people who were abusing were abusing other children at the same time. And sometimes the children started abusing other children. And we've heard of that. And we write about the fact that people who are raised in institutions where they are the victims of abuse often themselves become abusers. Physical abusers, they become bullies, they become violent, they treat people wrong. But they sometimes become sexual abusers as well. They don't know how to treat women right. They don't know how to treat little boys right. And that was going on in those schools. So a handful of people we're doing a tremendous amount of damage because those children were not allowed to leave. They were literally locked up with the people who were abusing them. And not every child who went to the school was abused, of course. We know that there were many who were not physically abused, who were not sexually abused. Over 50% tell us that they never suffered any abuse. But why were they affected by all of this so deeply? Well, it's because, they say, they lived in fear of being the next one. Imagine, if you're in a dormitory and you hear an adult coming looking for a victim in the middle of the night, will it be you or will it be somebody else? And how thankful you are that it's not you and how guilty you feel because it wasn't you. That's what they had to live with too. And they talk about that. They talked openly about that. That shame and that guilt for not having been abused but for having lived in that fear and for not being able to do anything to stop it. And we heard many instances of people who did try to stop it. Many teachers did what they could, particularly in the latter years, 
when teachers were more professionally trained. Just across the field here, you see a, a building that housed an education program. It was called the Normal School. My aunts went there. Two of my aunts became teachers, went to that school there to become teachers. But for most of the existence of Indian residential schools, the people who taught in those schools were not trained to be teachers. They were trained to be indoctrinators. There is such a word. If there isn't, I just made it up. But they were trained to do something, to do whatever it was, to move people from one way of viewing things to another way, to indoctrinate them into a different way of thinking. And that's what residential schools were all about, centers of indoctrination. They were designed to take children away from parents who were going to raise them to believe in their traditional, indigenous, spiritual way of thinking, and to raise them to become like white children, Christian, beloving, beloving of everything European, and to believe in the rightness of European culture, European ways of doing things, European governments, and European history. That's the way we were raised. I can remember until I was old enough to think it through of being very proud about the fact that in our schools we had these huge maps of the world with all the pink on it that represented the countries at one time that belonged to the British Commonwealth because we were members of the British Commonwealth here in Canada. And all of these other countries, we were connected to them. And so we were important because of that, we who lived here. But in later years, I went to law school and I tell people, when they ask me, why did I go to law school? I tell them it's because I began to wonder why. Why were things the way that they are? I wanted to do something about that. Originally, I went to law school to get into politics. But as many of you know, I then became a lawyer and I became a judge for over 30 years, being a lawyer, being a judge, before I got into politics. It's never too late. tell you a little secret story, incidentally. I retired from being a judge in 2016, and at the final event of the TRC, I announced publicly, I am retiring from public life. I'm not going to do this anymore because I'm exhausted. My family has given up so much, I want to give them back some of me. So I promised my family I would retire from public life and devote some time to them. So I retired on January 31st, 2016. And on February the 8th, the Prime Minister called <laughs> and said, I'd like to appoint you to the Senate. And I said, I was a judge for 28 years one of the most respected positions in Canadian society. And I've just come from almost 10 years of working on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and it has produced a report which many people tell me is the most significant report that they've ever read about our society. I said, and I'm riding a wave that's 50 feet high, and you want me to do what? I said, I have to talk to my family first. And I did. But their conversation with me was, first of all, did I want to do it? Secondly, was I ready to do it? And if, if I did, they would support me. They acknowledged the importance of it, so they were prepared to let me do it. And my wife said, you've been home for eight days, you have already organized the cupboards twice, so I think you should do it. <laughs> but I went to law school because I wanted to know why things are the way they are. 
I went to law school because in the 1970s, growing up, I could see that people were being incarcerated at high rates from among our communities. I could see the large number of indigenous children going into the child welfare system. I could see the poverty. I grew up in that poverty. I could see the domestic violence. I had seen that in my family. I saw the confusion among young people about who they were. I saw the racism that was directed at us, because I was the victim of that racism too. People who I grew up with, who I had a lot of respect for, when push came to shove, often turned their backs on me, wouldn't acknowledge me. I remember, in fact, inviting people to come and stay overnight at my house, and my friends telling me, my mom won't let me. And they couldn't tell me why or wouldn't. And I never did figure out why until later. But I wanted to know at that age when I was experiencing these questions, why are things the way they are? And so I went to law school to find out. I wanted to know why the people of St. Peter's where I grew up had been evicted from our lands. My grandfather talked about this when I was a little boy. Were evicted from our lands and moved up to Peguis. Only 40 years after we had signed a treaty in which the government of Canada promised that we could have those lands forever along the Red River. Prime agricultural land that our people had farmed for hundreds of years. But the government decided they wanted that agricultural land for newcomers. They wanted to provide it as an incentive for people to come here from Europe. And so they booted us off. Took them five tries. Three illegal votes. Two of them they lost. One of them they finally won. And the courts overturned it. And they passed a law that made it legal. I wanted to know why they did that. I wanted to know how the law worked and how they could get away with that. So I went to law school. And when I was in law school, I saw, because of the work I was doing in law school with students and with members of the public who were caught up in troubles in, in court system, that people who were representing them were not doing, them a, ver not doing a very good job. They didn't understand them didn't know who they were, didn't know what they had experienced, where they were coming from. So I decided I would do that for a while. Before I went into politics, I thought I'll just practice law for a little while. And I practiced law, and I was good at it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed fighting with Crown attorneys. I enjoyed arguing with judges. I enjoyed telling them they were wrong. I enjoyed doing re research and pointing out to them why their thinking was backwards. I enjoyed all of that. But I particularly enjoyed it when the chiefs would hire me to do something, to work on behalf of their communities. And during the repatriation process of the Constitution in the early 1980s, when they hired me to run workshops for all the communities, I enjoyed doing that because it gave me an opportunity not just to teach about the law, but to learn about our law. First time I ever went to a community to run a constitutional repatriation workshop was at Sioux Valley. And when I got there, all of the elders were sitting in front of me. And they said to me, before you talk to us about this new constitution that's coming here, why don't you listen to us? And they spent two and a half days, almost three, explaining to me their history as a people and how they did things and how they dealt with people who did wrong and their traditions around marriage, their traditions around child rearing, their traditions around feasting, around ceremony, their traditions around war, when they go to war, why they go to war, who can go to war, all of those traditions, they talked to me about that. And at the end of that, 
I decided to quit being a lawyer because I realized I didn't know anything. But one of the elders, a man by the name of Angus Merrick, said, you just need to know what it means to be an Anishinaabe. You have to learn that first. You have to learn what that means because until you learn what that means, that other knowledge you have will not be effective. You will not be as good as you could be until you learn that part of yourself. And it just so happened to be around the time that Nigon was born, my son, who inspired me just by being born. He inspired me to want to give him a life that was better than I had, to give him a foundation that was stronger and higher than the foundation I had, to give him knowledge and access to knowledge that it took me years to discover. I wanted to do that for him and for his sisters when they came along because they were those little children that I told you to think about. They were the ones that I loved the most. They are my legacy. And I wanted them to be the richest people in this world, armed with the knowledge that they all deserve to have, that you all have, because you have that from your grandmothers, from your aunties, from your parents, from your community, from your church, from your way of belief. You receive that every day. And you are the richer for it. You are the stronger for it. And you are good people because of it. In our tradition, there is an expression that the elders use about what it is that we must grow up to be. Anishinaabe kije nin. It's a simple expression. Anishinaabe kije nin. I want to be a kind man. If you can say that, then that is your true ambition. Anishinaabe kije nin. I want to be a kind man because that is what our teachings are all about, as are yours. If you are a kind man, if you are a kind person, there is nothing that you can't do, and there is nothing that will happen to you that you can't overcome, because others will be kind to you and will help you. Kindness is the key to everything. It is the key to reconciliation. But it's also important for you to understand this history. It's important for you to understand that Anishinaabe people, Aboriginal people, are coming from this life of oppression. What's also important for you to understand is not every person who was of Aboriginal ancestry went to one of those schools. In fact, my good friend, who's a historian at University of Regina, James Miller, he thinks probably 30 to 35 percent of First Nations people went to residential school, and he's probably right. 150,000 names are on the First Nations Indian Residential School Registry, and I think that's probably a third of the number of Indigenous children who grew up during that period of time. Maybe a little, a little low, but still, even if it's 30 to 35 percent, that means 65 to 70 percent of indigenous people never went to a residential school, yet we are all affected by it. I never went to a residential school, but I'm affected by that. Well, I'm affected by it because my dad went, my mom went, my grandparents who raised me, they went, and they were living the lives of survivors who had experienced that lifestyle, those tragedies, that pain, that dysfunction. They were living it every day, and they were struggling 
And as I said, my grandmother grew up believing only one way of worshiping God, and that was through the Catholic way. She raised me to be a Catholic priest. I was supposed to be a priest, and I was, until two major events occurred in my life. One was I studied history. And my review of the history of the Catholic Church was not something that made me feel very proud about the Church, particularly its involvement in the Holocaust. But the second major thing was I kept falling in love with girls. <laughs> and I kind of got tired of being ashamed about it. I thought it was just the most normal thing in the world. And it is, for me. It was not something I could see myself denying. And so I gave up on that ambition. But when I went to my grandmother and I said to her, I want to go to university, because she was my guardian. She needed to sign the form to allow me to go to university. I said, I want to go to university. I want to be a teacher like my aunties. And she said, no, no, no. You're going to a seminary. You're going to study to be a priest. And I said, I don't want to be a priest. I don't want to do that. The only time I think I ever made her cry. Because she had such ambitions for me. And she didn't sign the forms. Until the very last moment when I went to her and I said, I have to return these forms this morning in order to take the university entrance courses that I'm required to take. Will you sign them for me? And she said, I thought about this. And I don't want you to go to university. I want you to become a priest, but it is your choice. And if you do that, she said, I will make sure that you can go. But you must promise me that you will do something with that education and you will not become an educated drunk. You will do something with that education. And so I have tried and I'm still trying to do something with that knowledge. Not all of the things that have educated me have been through the universities are the schools, been through discussions and dialogue with people like you. Because so much of what it is that we have to learn is not in books, not in classrooms, it's in the community. And our communities need to learn how to interact with each other again. We have forgotten how to do that in some ways. Maybe social media is to blame, I don't know, maybe television. I'm not expert enough to be able to say that. All I know is that we don't talk to each other as neighbors much anymore. Urbanization has caused us to feel great distances between the person who lives right beside us and me. And so we need to change that somehow. And we have a long way to go because the public schools of this country have been teaching all children that indigenous people are pagans, inferior, uncivilized, and that the government of Canada took over their lands, took over their lives, took over their existence legitimately and with their best interests at heart. And that Indigenous people would have disappeared, we were told, would have become extinct if it hadn't been for the Europeans who took care of us. Never mind that we'd been here for 50,000 years before the arrival of the Europeans and that Europeans have only been here for 500 years or less. But we kindly forget that fact. The conqueror holds the stories of truth. And our ambition as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was to show the other truth. 
and to combine it with the known truths and to see what we came up with. And what we have come up with, we hope, is a better way of understanding who we are as Canadians. And that way of understanding is to know that as Canadians, we will not be true to ourselves until we learn how to embrace this history, how to make it part of us, how to make it part of who we are as Canadians, how to make it part of this country's reputation and this country's name. If we learn how to do that, then we can celebrate as one. But until then, we will live with walls between us. We will live as strangers to each other because you will not think kindly of me and because of that I will not think kindly of you. I have said before, and I'll say it tonight, reconciliation turns on one very simple concept. I want to be your friend. And I want you to be mine. So that whenever anything goes wrong for you or for me, we can fix it together. And this country has gone wrong and we must fix it together. But we must first fix our relationship. Our relationship is very much like a family relationship with a history of domestic violence. We have to address the domestic violence. We have to talk about it. We have to put it into some perspective. We have to be able to come to terms with it, which is not to say that we have to forgive everybody we have to come to terms with it. We have to acknowledge that we have experienced it. We have to acknowledge the perpetrators. We have to acknowledge the victims. We have to give validation to the truth of all of that. And then we have to figure out how we can move forward armed with that knowledge. And it's a challenge. But first of all, the victims of that past need to be given an opportunity to regain their footing. Reconciliation is about having a relationship of mutual respect, but we cannot have mutual respect until Indigenous people are given an opportunity to have self-respect. If you want to know why our young Indigenous children are committing suicide, at such a high rate, the highest rates of suicide in the world are occurring among young indigenous people. It's because they've given up hope. They haven't given up hope on you. They haven't given up hope on Canadian society. They haven't given up hope on the chance to be a father or mother. They've given up hope on who they are. They've given up hope on feeling proud about themselves. They don't feel pride. They are not proud. We need to give them back that pride. It begins with education. Education is the key to reconciliation. I've said that before. It's key because in the public schools we need to change the way that we teach children about this country the way we teach children about what it means to be citizens, about what it means to know your community, about what community is. We need to teach children about Indigenous communities. Those of you who've grown up here probably cannot name the First Nations communities of this province. You probably don't know where they are. For the longest time, the Department of Highways, in fact, Never put up signs when you were driving by a First Nation reserve. You could drive right by Fisher River, Pegasus, Sioux Valley, never see a road sign put up by the Department of Highways to know that you're just driving by a reserve because it just wasn't in their thinking. And yet Crystal City got a sign. 
Plum Cooley got a sign. Morden. Morden got about five signs, as I recall. All of those little communities out there, they all have signs. But we never got signs. It's because we didn't belong. The Canadian government decided 150 years ago that we, as Indigenous people, did not belong. That we could belong if we decided to give up being Indigenous. But if we insisted on being Indigenous, we did not belong. And they would do nothing to help us belong. And so, in this day and age, we need to work on how to help those young people who are thinking about ending their lives feel like they belong, like they are valid. They need to know their history. They need to know that they have a creation story. They need to know that they have teachings about what it means to be a husband, what it means to be a wife, what it means to be a father and a mother. They have teachings about marriage. They have teachings about property ownership. Oh yeah, you've probably been taught, like many people, that indigenous people don't have a concept of ownership. That is so far from, tr from the truth, it's incredible. You stole an Indian man's horse, you paid for it. No question of that. Jesuit relations back in the 16, 1600s recorded instances of people being punished for taking another person's property. And we knew that, but yet we allowed the lie to persist. And it was because it was convenient. We have to stop doing those convenient things and we have to start doing the hard things. So we have a long way to go. I have said reconciliation will probably not occur in my lifetime. Probably won't occur in the lifetime of my children, but it will occur will occur because you need to make a promise. You don't need to promise that reconciliation will happen. You need to make a promise that reconciliation should happen. And if you believe that reconciliation should happen, then it will. And you need to teach your children. You need to teach those little boys and girls who are an important part of your lives today. You need to teach them that reconciliation should happen. You need to teach them about respect and about kindness. It's not going to be easy. They will experience lots of outside influences, as you know. But you are the biggest influence that they have now, and you will set that foundation. And if you do it right, then your children your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews will be your legacy and you will be proud of them as I am proud of mine. Thank you very much. Now, this is where it all goes to hell, incidentally. We're going to do Q&A. <laughs> Let me first say thank you before oh, that okay. happens. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Now we, we've closed the good part. Is that, is that what you Oh, said? yeah, now it gets tough. Okay, this is, okay. Where, this is where we're going to start. Okay, uh, everyone, breathe in, breathe out. <laughs> uh, he has said he is willing for Q&A. Uh, there are a lot of people here and we'd like to include as many different voices and conversation as possible. So I will ask you to come to your question uh, fairly early on in your comments uh, so that we can give as many access points here today as possible. Let's get that young girl. Uh, yes, I'm going to call her. What? Kaylee? Kaylee? Is it Kaylee? Kaylee, I think. 
Um, there, Terry Schomburg back there has a, a microphone for those, uh, dare I say, on the margins over there, the edges, <laughs> the edges over there. And then, of course, there is the microphone here, but maybe, Terry, you could take your mic to Kaylee first, because I think that one is set too high for her to approach. Some of you have, may have heard of the Lavely School being interviewed uh, this past week. Uh, they responded to a poem, I don't know if you're going to share that first, but a poem that Senator Sinclair wrote, and there's a response uh, that I think Kaylee's going to make from Lavely School. So, you want to start us off? Sure. Stand up, Kaylee, if you can. So, I'm Kylie Wilson, and my poem is called With You. I grieve for the souls that don't have control, for the ones that need help, the ones that seek justice. I grieve with you through the unique, through the disappointing. I grieve for the survivors of residential schools and the generation to come after. I grieve for the masses that left their hometown. I grieve for the people who are given the key to heaven. I grieve for the people who are told to get over it and be strong. Grief is a liar. Grief tries to tell us there's nothing good. There is no point. There is no beauty. That everything is lost. There is no hope to give up. Grief is a liar. I grieve for the places up north that don't have a lot of edu educational funding. I grieve for the indigenous people who are treated this way. Why are they treated this way? I grieve for those whose parents had to go through this as a child who now pass it on to the youth. I grieve for those whose dreams were broken, then and now. I grieve for the treaties that were never kept. I grieve for the failed systems of the world. I grieve for the plight of our indigenous peoples. I grieve for the words of the elders that fall on the deaf ears of the youth. I grieve for the people that take for granted what they have. I grieve for the masses that do no wrong, but still must deal with it and fix it. I grieve for the people that go through drug and alcohol abuse. I grieve with you through the times when the flames of our souls were being burnt out. I grieve for the people that are going through a storm and your silent presence is more powerful than a million empty words. Thank you, Kylie. Thank you. That captured a lot of what we have been hearing this evening. So I invite you, come forward, say your name, a question, enter into conversation. All right. Well, that was nice of you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. One, one brave soul back there. Go ahead. Okay. Two points. I'm going through the archives that's uh, at the University of Manitoba. They're fabulous. You can see uh, by quarter what students, how they did in their class. You can follow them all the way through their time at residential school to see whether they improved at all. Did they stay in first grade for four years? Were 15-year-olds in second grade? Were many of them hospitalized? Were they sent to sanatoriums? But my question is for right now. I, I know a family. They have um, some mental health issues. They're facing drug and um, alcohol issues. Um, sometimes you go in their home, they're empty cupboards. At one point, all their kids were taken by Child and Family Services. Uh, I know that we're supposed to be the grandmother, be the parent, be the friend, but sometimes I feel that society and I am, am just not totally equipped. So I'm wondering, do you see around the country places that train people who might be grandmothers, who might be grandfathers to these kids? On, and, and is that system working? Because the people I've met are residential school survivors themselves, the, the adults. And they've come from families where both their parents were residential school survivors. 
And I think these parents and grandparents, the indigenous ones, some of them really don't have all the skills they should to be a, a, a superior parent, uh, even though they give lots of love and care. And uh, There are, um, I know uh, from my experience as a judge that there are uh, centers that are being have been established by um, child welfare agencies or government departments uh, called the family training centers or family support centers or euphemisms similar to that uh, with the intent being to uh, support mothers particularly to learn how to be mothers to learn how to provide uh, for the children that they have uh, often the, uh, the situation that, of training that they're put into, and I've, I've had some of these cases in court before me, situations that they're put into involve uh, attending lectures like this and being lectured to and being told uh, how to be a mother, the things that you need to do, <clears throat> when in reality motherhood comes from a hands-on experience and you can't learn how to be a mother in a classroom. And so the best situation, of course, is to be surrounded by other mothers while you're coping with your child. And there are no facilities like that that I'm aware of other than perhaps through uh, special programs that uh, involve bringing parents together in order to um, learn from other parents. And I don't know many programs like that, to be honest with you. I don't know where the speaker went to, but <clears throat> the, um, the reality is that uh, the, the system does not uh, function well when it tries to um, do those kinds of uh, heartfelt activities. Uh, they function well when they do cold bureaucratic things, but to try to be warm and fuzzy uh, Usually there's too many rules and regulations that get imposed upon it, and as a result, uh, those rules and regulations get in the way of being able to do the human thing. And the human thing is really the key to programs like that. And uh, I don't know many programs like that that exist or are successful. I imagine there are some, but considering the huge numbers of indigenous people who are caught up in the child welfare system, uh, over 50% of all children in care in Canada are Indigenous kids. You know that uh, we need a lot more than that. Um, and the real question I think that that idea begs is why can't we do that kind of a program or provide that kind of service to the families and the parents in their own homes as opposed to taking the child away and then making the mother come into some kind of a a program or institutional environment to learn in that kind of an environment as best she or he or they can to uh, how to become a parent. The way they learn to become parents are through their parents and through watching other parents in their family be parents. I know that uh, my aunties learned from watching their sisters, my other aunties, dealing with their children how to be mothers and from listening to my grandmother and my, what I called, what we used to call our big aunties, which were my grandmother's sisters, uh, the elders in our family, who would give them advice or instruction about how to deal with, any, with something that they were facing. So it's that kind of a different environment. Um, and I don't know of many government programs that have the capacity to do that. Let's move to the front here. My name is Heather, and I want to start by saying I want to be your friend, too. I uh, had the uh, great pleasure of being in New Zealand in October, and after teaching a three-day workshop uh, with a group of women, there were three Maori women in the group, and the Maori people there have, ex have similar experiences to the Indigenous people here. And at the end of the workshop, those three Maori women uh, stood up and sang a blessing to me for having come to their land and teaching them. And what struck me more than the fact that these Maori women did this was that everyone in the room, every New Zealander stood up and sang with them in Maori language. And I was 
it completely captivated me. So I inquired into it and found out that every single person in New Zealand has to take an education in Maori language from the day that they are in grade one through to, to high school. And so my question is more of a contemplation for all of us, not specifically for you, but for all of us is how can we, what can we do to change our education system so that our children one day will be in a circle where they can all sing along with an indigenous blessing so that we have enough um, knowledge and wisdom of, of your culture and the culture of the people on this land that we can join in in that kind of a, a ceremonial blessing. Good question. One of the um, important answers, we, and we talk about it in the TRC report, we also talked about it in the AJI report back in 1991. Um, one of the keys to the future for indigenous communities and indigenous families and indigenous individuals was the ability to find a way to revive their connection to their culture, to their history, to their own teachings, because that was something that many indigenous people were trying to do. We're trying to figure out a way to do that. And then try to figure out a way to make that adaptation work in this modern day and age. Um, I remember being at a workshop with elders in which we spent the better part of a morning trying to figure out how to say in Anishinaabe, in Ojibwe, how to say microwave oven. <laughs> and, I, and I distinctly remember one of the elders saying, when the Creator created us, He knew we were going to have microwave ovens, so let's figure out what He wanted us to <laughs> say about that. And there's nothing funnier, incidentally, than listening to Cree people trying to tell you what the word for gorilla is. Because there are no gorillas in the north, and the Cree, the Cree word for gorilla is about 28 syllables long, and it's actually a description of a hairy man with long arms who walks around <clears throat> and and that's the word for for gorilla but the uh, the reality is that young people today and, and I know because I, I, I presided in youth court and young people would often tell me that they feel lost they want to know what does it mean to be in Anishinaabe what is it where am I going to find my culture I want to know my language we had a, an interview with, um, as part of the TRC work, the commissioners interviewed a number of government officials, and one of the government officials that we interviewed was the official languages commissioner for Canada. And he works primarily with French and English programming. He works exclusively with French and English programming. And, uh, and we talked to him about what does it take to establish good language programming. And he, before we talked about that, though, he remarked upon the work that we were doing. And he said, you know, in all of my work, he said, I've been a language commissioner now for almost 10 years. In all of the places I've gone throughout Canada, indigenous people are the only ones who refer to something they call my language, even though they can't speak it. They can't speak it, but to them, it's still my language. I want to learn my language. They still own it but they can't use it because they don't know it. And so he said, that tells you the magnitude of the problem, that they are connected to their language in their heart, but it never made its way into their mind, into their tongue. And so because of that, that sense of loss is very important. And that's just a small example of the sense of loss that they feel everywhere. And the Maori people have gone through a cultural revival of intense proportion. There's no question of that. They've really worked hard at it. And um, um, some say that one of the instigators for it was a movie that was made back in the 70s, I think, called Once Were Warriors. I commend it to you, incidentally. Once Were Warriors. It's a great movie. It's about the impact of... Uh, cultural oppression and civilization and colonialism on the lives of Maori people. And uh, it's the very same kind of story that indigenous people are facing here, the very same kind of history. And for indigenous communities now, they see their future as being about finding ways to revive their culture, beginning with language. So if they're able to find a way to address language 
their language needs and give language to their children, to their students, then they will be able uh, to do the next step very easily, which is to talk about their history and their culture, because all of that is built into the language. So whether or not that extends into the rest of Canadian society, I don't know. I get the feeling that many Canadians are not like you, who are, are not eager to embrace Indigenous culture and practices in that way as part of what it means to be a Canadian. They'll do it for the novelty, they'll wear the, the clothes and the jewelry, um, but they don't feel the connection to it. We have to get Canadians to feel the connection. So. I've got a question here, first of all, from the University of Fraser Valley in Abbotsford, BC. There's a group of students listening to you there. Question for you. The BC school curriculum has recently been reformed to include many aspects of the TRC. With this in mind, why do you feel it will still be so long to see reconciliation? Well, one of the reasons why it's going to take us so long is because there's going to be pushback. There's going to be pushback from elements in Canadian society who do not see the benefit or the need for this that they, uh, in fact, still believe there's a, a significant population of people in Canadian society who still believe that the work of assimilation has not been completed and should be. And so that's why we get people who say, why don't you just get over it and get on with being a Canadian? Uh, we gave you money. We've recognized the wrong. We apologize. So get over it and let's get going. Without recognizing that getting over it is not complete until we are able to be who we were meant to be, which means that we're not going to be like you. And that's the next step out of that history that people fail to recognize. And so that pushback is part of the dialogue. And there are many people who feel that way unconsciously without even realizing it. And we need to bring that out in the open so we can have a discussion about it and overcome the fear that that raises for many Canadians, which is, what does that mean to me when you demand your rights? What does that mean to my rights? What does that mean to my ownership? What does that mean to my government? What does that mean to my municipality? What does that mean to my land? What does it mean to my church? What does it mean to my institutions? And those conversations have to occur, and it's gonna take a long time for those conversations to occur. If I had enough time in my life, and I don't because I'd have to live another 150 years, I would write a book about every step that we have to follow to get to reconciliation, because I'd have to anticipate so much. There's so many things that we cannot now think about that we're going to have to do. Many think that all we have to say is, yes, I like you, and that's it. Yes, I'll let you marry my daughter, and that's it. It's more than that. The real question is, will you acknowledge that a constitutional change is necessary to put into place the, in, the right of indigenous governance that indigenous people are asking for? Do you believe it that much? Do you believe that there should be a royal proclamation announced by the queen or the Governor General of Canada in the Queen's name, recognizing that this country will forever be committed to maintaining a balanced relationship with Indigenous people. Do you believe that? Do you believe that we need a Council for Reconciliation that will always be reporting to the public every year on what's happening around this country? Do you believe that we should ban those people from forming organizations that are devoted to fighting against reconciliation with violence? Do you believe that we should get rid of guns because they are an enemy to many of us? Do you believe enough to do what you need to do for reconciliation to be worth living? Do you trust yourself? Do you trust us? That's the key. Many people don't trust us. By us, I mean indigenous people. 
they think for some reason there is this belief, and it's because there are some indigenous people who are saying it, but they believe that we're all going to chase you back to Europe. And that ain't going to happen. Europe won't have you. <laughs> but more importantly, we need you. We need you here. We have to figure out a way to make this work together. We really do. But you have to behave better. And the way that you behave better is by recognizing how your behavior today is a manifestation of what went on in the past. You have to know that there is some of that going on in each and every one of you. You have to know that. And you have to figure out what that is and you have to address it. Let's go to the back there, Terry. My name is Clarence Giesbrick. Um Question I already asked when I was at university here in 1974, one of the elders of this church, had to do with good people and the things they do. And you would started your conversation about kindness. And given the, what I think is a current sort of popular definition of kindness, some of the kindest people in my life are the biggest bigots I've ever have to deal with. And they will give the shirt off the back for the people around them, but they will not let institution changes, which is the kind of stuff that you talked about in the last part of that uh, conversation. So I'm just wondering about whether you have a different definition of kindness that might be helpful, because for me, I've largely thrown it out as, as irrelevant. Because the kind people I know in my past have absolutely no sympathy for 150 years of colonization. They have absolutely no interest in moving to reconciliation and uh, I maybe you have a different def definition than I have but I'd like to hear you speak about that I have other questions but I'll just leave it at that one we don't have enough time <laughs> for you and I to have a conversation about kindness tonight but we need to have a, def a conversation about kindness because the kind of people that you're talking about who tell you that they're being kind, they're not being kind. They are not kind at all. If you have a limit on your kindness, you are not being kind. You do not know what it means to be kind. And it's like, if your definition of love is to hurt somebody, you do not know what it means to love because it's not that at all. But we do need to come to a common understanding of what that means. Here, and then I'll take Moses next, all right. Hello, my name is Tamara Fontaine. Can you speak directly into the microphone there? Okay. Sing a song while you're there. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a good singer. Hi, my name is Tamara Fontaine, and my question about is, where, were children taken away in the 60s scoop included in the work of the TRC? Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Were the children... Of the 60s uh, scoop yeah. included in the TRC. Yes. Okay. Um, if you read the report, you'll see that there, we have a reference to the 60s scoop. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened was in 1951, the government of Canada officially decided to shut down the residential school system. Approximately 1951. And it was because of a variety of things that were happening internationally. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of the Child, uh, the Convention on Genocide, all of which uh, the government of Canada were, was a signatory to, and they knew that they were not complying with it because of the residential school system. So in the early 1950s, the government of Canada decided to shut down the residential school system. In order to do it, they had to ease their way out of it. And in order to ease their way out of it, what they started to do was they started to get the parents to sign transfers of guardianship so that parents had to fill out an application to ask that their child be put into a school, even though they weren't really asking. They were being told, you've got to put your kid into school. But they had to sign a form, said, we're asking you to accept our child into the school, and we hereby transfer guardianship of our child to 
the department or to the Indian agent or to the person who's running the school uh, so that they can make decisions about our child while he's in their care. Many of those children were never given back to the parents. They were kept in the school and the government took the position beginning in the late 1950s and the early 60s that these children were now their wards. That's where the idea of wardship became very popular among the government. <clears throat> that indigenous children were the wards of the government now. But the government was shutting down the school system, so what were they going to do with them? So they started signing agreements with the provinces uh, across the country to transfer these children who were wards of the federal government over to the child welfare system in each of the provinces. And that's why when you look at the child welfare statistics in each of the provinces, they began to shoot up in the 19, early 1960s, late 1950s. And uh, uh, the result is what is often referred to as the 60s scoop, as though the provinces went in and started apprehending kids. But in reality, the provinces were the dumping ground for kids by the department to a large extent. Uh, but they also did sign child welfare agreements with the provinces that allowed the provinces to send in their child protection agents to the reserves to start apprehending kids. So there were agents from the provinces who were going into the communities to apprehend kids, and that became part of the provincial role. So there was, to that extent, a scooping of children. But the large numbers of children who were transferred into the provincial child welfare system, combined with those provincial agents who went into the reserves, resulted in the 60s scoop. Now we talked about that in the TRC report. And we also, talked about the need for those children to receive some kind of acknowledgement for what was done wrong to them because they are connected to the legacy of residential schools. Even those who had been apprehended in their home communities by the social workers from the provinces were being apprehended from families who had been damaged by the child welfare, by the Indian residential school system. So there was a, a direct and an indirect connection. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take one more question there, and then Moses, you're our closing question there. Sorry, Moses. Yeah, I've got all these hands waving. Go ahead there, Terry, whoever Hi. has it. Hi, my name is Ray Shaw. I came from rural Manitoba tonight to speak to you and ask you for a favor. Only in rural Man Manitoba, we have a our municipal act, which has a section called 374. 374 allows municipalities to outbid people and actually confiscate their homes. And I would really appreciate if you would help us with 374 and have that section of the act taken out. Okay. <laughs> you want to tell me why? Well, in the case of 374, it's, it's governments taking people's properties, it's property rights. As far as I'm concerned, it's, it's in opposition with, the, um, with everything in Canada we stand for. It, it doesn't happen in Winnipeg, the laws are different. Only in rural Manitoba. It doesn't happen in other provinces because the laws are different. I've called all the other provinces and talked to them and only in one other case, and I think it was Nova Scotia, where there was a brothel and the government didn't like it, so what they did is they, outpaid, they, they outbid the people and bought the brothel. But other than that, I don't think that's ever been done anywhere. So therefore, if you're in a little rural municipality, which is not very important to anybody, one of the problems I have is, I'm from rural Manitoba, which is not very important to a lot of people. But it's really important to us. And I really think that property rights are part of Canada's rights. And I'm asking you if you would look at 374, if there's a chance I can show you some of the documentation on 374, I would really appreciate it. Okay, let's have an acknowledgement on your part that this has nothing to do with the truth and reconciliation conversation we're having, right? It's reverse. I'm now asking you to help the 
people of rural Manitoba. The non-Indigenous people. That's right. All right. And let's... also it's affecting Indigenous uh, people. We okay. just had an Indigenous person. No, Excuse no. me, sir. Let's have a conversation later maybe, all right? Yeah. Okay. Moses, you've been waiting there. Hello. Uh, my name is Moses, and I've been thinking about some things, and I, I really appreciate your encouragement to us and our need to look forward towards reconciliation. And I know a lot of the work that you and the TRC have done, though it looks at, at our past and dealing with our past, providing healing and providing uh, this term that I've been thinking about, justice. And, and so my question is about justice because coming from a Christian perspective, we believe that um, one of the attributes of our creator is that he is a just God. And so we are supposed to be people of justice as well, as ironic as that is considering some of our history. Um, but now being through the TRC, and I had the chance to be in Ottawa for the closing sessions, and it was very moving. And one of the questions that I was wondering is, through this whole process, have we seen justice? And, and so I'm just curious from your perspective as an expert in our judicial system, and from your own understanding of what justice is all about, uh, now that TRC is wrapped up, although we still have so much to do, have we seen justice? And if not, what's missing? You're another one that waits till the very end to ask a four-day <laughs> four question. He did try yeah? to get in earlier. <laughs> right? No wonder you stood there uh, waiting so long to ask that question. <clears throat> That's a huge question. Uh, short answer is no, we do not have justice for indigenous people in this country. That's quite apparent, I think. And the reason we don't have justice for indigenous people is that because the justice system that has been brought to this country is founded upon principles of behavior and processes that stem from a different way of thinking. The English common law system and the Quebec civil code system come from a, two European nations that have a different way of thinking about things about how to get to determining what's right and what's wrong. And the other problem with the justice system is that it says it's trying to do justice, but in reality the justice system is about applying the law. And the law is about defining rights, obligations, and consequences from breaching rights and obligations. Uh, and so the, the problem that we have is that we've dressed up the legal system as a justice system, but it's still nothing more than a legal system. It's a system about laws. And so when we talk about whether or not it's accomplishing that vision of providing justice to indigenous people, we should also be asking ourselves, is it providing justice to Canada? Is, is Canada, does Canada feel like the legal system is providing justice for all of you? Are you feeling like you could trust it with your life? Are you feeling like you could trust it with the lives of your children? When you know that at any point in time, a political party could get elected to lead this country and could pass laws to take away your little ones and put them into institutions because it's legal to do it. If we have a law that is defensible, then no matter what injustice that law creates, we still say that the rule of law trumps justice. The rule of law is a greater commitment, a more important commitment than justice. And the other problem is what your sense of justice is may be different from my sense of justice. So that's the problem with that. And so I can say indigenous people are not getting justice, but a lot of you might disagree with me because you believe in the rule of law. You believe that as long as the law is followed, and as long as the law is used to determine the answer to the question, and not somebody's made up sense of right and wrong, 
that that's the best answer. So you see, it's a complicated question. So every time you try to do justice, you have to ask yourself, is this in compliance with the law? Because sometimes to do justice will put you in opposition to the law. And sometimes to follow the law results in an injustice. Crazy, isn't it? <laughs> but that's the way our system is. Because on balance, if you follow the law, most of the time you get justice. Most of the time. But not all of the time. And that's why it's an imperfect system, but it's as perfect as we can make it. Unfortunately, we haven't figured out a way to do it better. I think this is, really? I promised him he could leave at 8.30 and we're after 8.30. Uh, how are you feeling? I'm feeling like I'm never getting out of the room until we talk to that lady here. Yes. So. <laughs> Can I say one more? Okay. All right. Uh, we're going one more in the back of the room. Someone has been standing there a long time before you even. Yes. Hi, Hi. everyone. My name is Patil, and I go to Lavalley School. Um, and in Lavalley School, we've had many speakers who are First Nations who have come and some are residential school survivors themselves, and they have told us their stories. Others, like Elder Jewels, are just elders who teach us the culture, basically. And something I always ask as a student is, what can I do? What can I do to create change? What can I do to be a part of reconciliation? What can I do to speed the process faster? Thank you. That's a brilliant question. It's a brilliant question uh, because it's probably the most important question of all. What can I do? What can I do about this? It's the question that many people ask us, in fact, uh, coming out of the work of the TRC. They usually pre, pre state, they usually tell us before they lead to the question, I never knew any of this. Nobody ever taught me any of this. So tell me, what can I do? And I say, you do whatever it is that you can do. Whatever you can do will be an improvement on doing nothing. And will be an improvement on doing the wrong thing. The wrong thing is to continue to do things the way we always have it. It's Einstein's Einstein's famous saying, you know, definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing every time, expecting a different result. You will not achieve change if you keep doing things the way that we have. So recognize that you're part of a system that needs change. You may be the least racist person in the whole world. You may in fact be the most progressive person in the whole world. But if you work for a system that is founded upon principles that are wrong, you need to change those principles in your system. You need to talk to your colleagues about changing the way you do business. You need to get people that you work with to stop prejudging others. You need to have communication with your children and your grandchildren. You need to tell them about things that you've learned. You need to read the damn report TRC report is 6,294 pages. That's a long report. It's even got pictures in it, but it's still a long report. But we wrote a summary. We wrote a summary. Okay? A summary is 600 pages long. Okay, so, so that's a long summary. So we did a summary of the summary. Summary of the summary is still 230 pages, sir. Right? <laughs> That's still a long report. So we have a summary <laughs> of the summary of the summary 
of the report. And it's about 100 pages long. So if you can stand reading, then read that. But if you can't stand reading, then read this. Hold your book up. See that? Turn it around. Let everybody see it. That is about 24, 47 pages long. Hey? 147 small pages. 147 small pages. It's got all of the calls to action on it, got some of the text. It's got some of the explanation behind each of the calls to action. You can get those books through the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. You might be able to get them in some of the bookstores. I don't know. But what I'm saying is that you need to understand this story if you want to do something. Whatever it is, you'll be able to do it. You need to understand. So do what you can to understand. Now I know that some of you don't like reading. So go to the internet, go to YouTube, click on Truth and Reconciliation, and you will find a couple of hundred videos that we have produced and placed on the internet showing some of the stories from survivors about what they've experienced. And share them with your friends. Have gatherings and talk about this. Talk about this. Pick a call to action and decide to do something about it. Do a letter writing campaign. You know Clara Hughes? Yeah, Clara Hughes, the famous Olympian. Clara was one of our honorary witnesses. We invited her to work with us during the work of the TRC. And she has done that. And she's been a tremendous asset for our cause. So she talked to her mom. And her mom, who still lives in the north end of Winnipeg, her mom decided that she was going to do something. So you know what she did? Every couple of weeks, she gets together with all of her friends. And she has a tea. Every afternoon on that day, she gets all her friends together and they have a tea. And they talk about the TRC report. They talk about one of those calls to action. And they invite people in to come and explain that call to action to them. And they talk about it. And then they talk about if they can do something about it. They talk about writing letters. They talk about phoning MLAs and MPs. They talk about maybe they can do something in the schools. They talk about things. So all of these tea grannies, as they call themselves, are doing something. But here's the best part, okay? They've involved their family in these discussions. And one of the ladies that, and, and Clara Hughes' mom told me the story, so I know it's true. One of the ladies has a granddaughter, had a granddaughter at one of these events, brought her along. Her granddaughter was going to have a baby. And they, at this particular gathering, they watched a video that we had produced. And in the video, I was giving a speech. And this young girl said to the tea grannies, I love Justice Sinclair. I think he is a wonderful human being. And I'm going to name my baby after him. And she did. <laughs> so somewhere in this city, there's a little guy running around, and his name is Justice. And that's a true story. Because <laughs> she thought my name was Justice. <laughs> so she named her little boy Justice. But you know, I would not have corrected her. I think every little boy should be called Justice. Every single one of us should have Justice in our name. Because that's important. It's important for us to believe in whatever it is that is the right thing to do, in your heart, you know what that is, you do it. Don't go out and make babies, incidentally, just because of that, okay? <clears throat> I'm not asking you That's to do that. That's not the right thing to do. <laughs> That's not the right thing to do. Well, it might be for you, but 
don't, don't go home and say, Mom, guess what? I'm going to have a baby next year this time, maybe. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sinclair. Today, with such a tremendous spirit of generosity, you did share stories of hope and challenge. And bear with me, it's maybe one of these professor type things that uh, we tend to do. I just feel there's some response beyond applause that is asked from us by things I heard you say. You said two things. We need to say reconciliation should happen. You said that we should say that reconciliation should happen. You also said we have to do better. We have to do better. Thank you for that sharing with us today. You have, uh, I think, set many of us on different paths. Thank you for joining your path with us tonight. You just reminded me of a story. Right. Can I tell you a little story before yeah. we get? My, my granddaughter Sarah, who's 11 years old, is in a speech contest. And so she asked me to help her with her speech. And so I did. I helped her, because it's a French immersion, so I helped her with doing the this, this speech in French. And so I helped her with a little grammar and a little bit of idea about where to put things. And, and so at the end of it, I said, that's a, that's a good speech. You know, I would hire you as a speechwriter in my office. You're a good speechwriter. And she said, thank you, Musham, but I have one more question. And I said, sure, my girl, what is it? She said, how do you make them stand up at the end? <laughs> and I said, talk too long and they'll have to stand up. <laughs> thank you. This was great. Please go see my colleague Val over there, and you can attend the Canadian School of Peace Building this summer, and uh, you will learn to do better. So please go visit her over there.